To our first speaker, though, is Jim Roberto, who is an associate director at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where he previously served as deputy for science and technology. A former president of MRS, Jim has served on numerous National Research Council studies and recently co-chaired a Department of Energy report on accelerating discovery and innovation through simulation-based engineering and science. A more comprehensive biography is available in the packet that I hope you all received at the door. And instead of taking up all of his time, I'm going to stop here and give Jim the floor. So Jim, thank you for being here. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Thank you for turning out. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, computational material science and the revolution that is occurring in materials based on the advances that have uh, occurred recently uh, in uh, the power uh, of computing. And I'd like to sort of start by grounding this in the national context. Why is this important? Uh, Discuss the challenge of complexity and how we can now address that in the design of materials. Uh, Show the impact that this can have uh, on the development of new materials to simulation-based engineering and science. You've all heard about materials by design. Uh, well, I think we're now at a time where we can actually talk about this in a realistic way, and I'll like to say, say a few things about that, particularly why now? And then finally, how we put all this together to uh, drive the innovation system. And so you've already heard up about this, that uh, 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 we have named our ages for materials, and uh, we also uh, have uh, seen advances in technology driven. And historically, this goes all the way from iron and steel to now silicon-based electronics. Materials really have been the driving force for innovation. And uh, uh, if you look uh, at technology broadly, you will find uh, that it has always been enhanced by the availability of materials. And in fact, uh, uh, there are many technologies even today that uh, should be much better than they are. Uh, It's been 100 years since we uh, saw the invention of the solar cell or the electric car or the rechargeable battery. We're certainly not where we need to be with those technologies. That's a materials problem. Uh, Fossil plants operate about two-thirds of their uh, optimum efficiency because we don't have materials that can survive in that environment. And we obviously have no consensus on nuclear fuel cycles. So none of these technologies are, are close to their potential because of barriers in materials. And in order to overcome these barriers, we need transformational advances. And I won't go through all of this slide, but this is, these are just the sorts of things, and there are more, that have to happen in order to uh, develop uh, uh, the materials that can lead to these advances in, in technology that we see. The important point here is that there are no fundamental scientific barriers to achieving these advances. You, you don't have to, have to reinvent physics to do this. Uh, the problem is that we just don't know how to do it, but there is no physical barrier to doing it. And in general, material science underpins competitiveness. Uh, progress in virtually all technologies depends on materials. Uh, The company or nation that learns how to develop and deploy advanced materials uh, most quickly uh, is, is uh, is going to win. And these transformative advances that are needed are going to happen. The question is, who's going to do it and when? So one of the challenges has, has been the complexity of advanced materials. Achieving the performance gains that are, are needed requires exploring a vast array of degrees of freedom. And if you just look at a couple of examples, if you look at modern steel, they are a, a million times uh, uh, more complex than uh, the early fields. If you want to uh, get a new 
catalyst, you're talking about billions of possible structures and chemical com- combinations. Intuitive trial and error is just not feasible anymore. We don't have the time and we don't have the resources to do all the experiments we, we can think of. <clears throat> so we have to transform the discovery process. And over the past two decades, the U.S. has developed and deployed the world's most powerful collection of tools uh, for doing advanced material science. Uh, World-leading x-ray and neutron sources, uh, nanoscale science centers, high-performance computers. What this has allowed us to do for the first time is to study materials at the length scale where properties are actually determined. Now, this is transformational. Uh, you, you, you can imagine the advantage that you have if the property that you're trying to improve is a property that's actually determined at the length scale where you actually can do the work. We did not have the ability to, to do that a decade ago. So the scale and quality of the U.S. scientific infrastructure conveys a, a, a considerable competitive advantage at this time uh, in the advanced materials field if we take advantage of it. Uh, the other striking change that has occurred, uh, and this is probably unprecedented in terms of the scale, uh, over the past decade, if you combine the advances in computer hardware and computer software, the performance gain is a factor of a million. When you change something by a factor of, of a million, you, you, uh, you really open up new op- opportunities. <clears throat> and, and we now have access to length scales, time scales, and numbers of particles uh, that really transform our ability to understand and design materials. This has profound implications for the discovery process. And so here are some early impacts of integrating uh, high-performance computing uh, with experiment uh, uh, in, the, in the manufacturing process. Uh, and John will say more about this, about this later, but, but you can see you know, five major corporations that had made commitments uh, to simulation-based uh, uh, engineering and science and integrating that into certain aspects of their product cycle, and you can see the outcomes where you have savings that, in some cases, approach $100 million, $100 million and, and uh, time in increases of factors of two and more. So last year, uh, the Office of Science of, of DOE, recognizing that this vast array of experimental capabilities and these uh, new uh, capacities in computing were combining in a very interesting way, convened a, a workshop on computational science and chemistry for innovation. And the idea was to assemble experts uh, uh, in, the, in the various fields, uh, uh, build off some of the existing studies had been, that, that had been done, and uh, actually look at the potential of experimentally validated simulations to accelerate discovery and innovation. Uh, this workshop attracted, I think, about 160 people. I can't see the number from here, but uh, yes, from, from 70 organizations. And perhaps uh, one of the innovations of this workshop was it it occurred last year at the time of the blackout in part of Washington, D.C. And so we had 160 scientists, engineers, uh, without Blackberries, without cell phones, and uh, it wasn't a catastrophe. In fact, they actually focused on the topic, and we had had a very good workshop. It's sort of like camping out with a roof over your head. So, uh, why now? Well, the experimental and computational facilities are in place. Uh, the, the availability of new materials is the pacing factor uh, for developing and deploying advanced technologies. 
And uh, what we find is that the computational capabilities in design and manufacturing have actually left the materials field in the dust because we have not integrated the computational capabilities uh, as they can be in uh, the materials field. So predictive design of materials is key to accelerating the discovery process and these advances are urgently needed across a whole spectrum of technologies. I believe we are at a threshold and the reason that the materials genome initiative was formulated, I, I believe, is this general consensus that we are at a threshold where a predictive understanding will transform our ability to design and deploy new materials. So this is, this is the problem. If you look at all of these uh, new materials that have been introduced over the past several decades, typically from discovery to commercialization, it has taken two decades. Uh, this is just not acceptable when you have a, a product design cycle that might be running more like three years. And so this is what we're trying to address. We're trying to drive this time down by including uh, high-performance computing as part of, uh, of the process. And here's an example from Gerb Cedar at MIT, which sort of shows the, the power of this. If you look, oh, let's see if this works. If you look over here, this is uh, the annualized discovery of new tertiary oxides uh, in Gerd Cedar's group over a period of six months, uh, a year or so ago. This is the discovery of the entire uh, scientific community over that time. So in, in a period of, of uh, uh, one, one group uh, basically uh, achieved a discovery rate that was uh, you know, three to four times that of the entire community. And so there's a lot of space that can be explored uh, by using uh, computational techniques. Of course, all of this has to be has to be validated, all this has to be integrated, the data has to be available, uh, the, the codes have to be improved, uh, information has to be shared, there's a lot of work to, to, to get to this point uh, in, a, in, a, in a fully effective way, but this is an indication of the promise. So how do we sustain a materials innovation infrastructure? Well, we need computational tools, uh, th these need to be user friendly they need, they need to be validated we also need to implement a framework uh, to develop uh, maintain and deploy software across academia and industry and perhaps one of the biggest challenges is going to be incorporating this in, uh, in medium and small companies on the experimental side we have to integrate the experimental Results uh, with the computational models, uh, so that we can we can validate those those models and accelerate screening and development of materials. We also need to leverage uh, these experimental capabilities to develop the data sets that are needed. And then under data systems, we have to establish uh, materials data storage and sharing systems that respect proprietary information, but also facilitate the incorporation of new data in, in, in models. And this is a substantial challenge uh, of the initiative. And uh, uh, this has to be done uh, 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 across the, the complete materials life cycle. So to create uh, this innovation system, uh, there are, are a number of uh, things that are, that are underway and that I think we have to focus on. One is the integration of synthesis process, processing, characterization, and simulation and modeling. Uh, we have to drive through to achieving uh, as close as we can to predictive capability in material science. We have to be able to span length scales from the molecule uh, to uh, uh, large-scale objects. Uh, we have to have a sustainable computational infrastructure. 
that includes uh, storage uh, data and app and app applications, and we have to find a way to efficiently transfer and incorporate this in industry. And so I'd like to conclude by saying that we live in a materials world, that materials underpin virtually all advanced technologies, that computational material science uh, combined with experiments uh, can transform the way we design and develop and deploy advanced materials, and that leadership in materials is essential to leadership in innovation. Thank you very much.